It was June 2016, and my friends kept begging me to go to this party. I didn't really want to go because it was far from where I lived. And as we all can tell, I'm not a very enthusiastic walker. They kept begging me to go, and they reminded me how much money I could make by selling drugs at the party. Long story short, I went, and it was a successful night. After the party, we were leaving, and a group of kids from a different city were in our city. I took the chance to multiply my evening's earnings, so I decided to rob them. As I approached him, he put his hand in his pocket. My friend said something. I looked back, and when I turned back around, a 25 caliber handgun pointed right at my stomach. Bang. The bullet ripped through my stomach, slicing my spleen and puncturing my lungs, and then lodging into my L2 of my lower spine. I lunged forward. We tussled for the gun. I managed to get away from him. When I was on the floor, I turned, pointed the gun, click, the gun jams. Say what you want, but that gun jamming probably changed my life forever. As I laid there, bleeding out, the only thing I could do was focus on my breathing. Three days later, I'm sitting in Washington Dulles International Airport, waiting to catch a flight to Honduras on a medical mission trip. It was my third time on a trip like that, and actually a break from the work that I do here in the States. A couple years earlier, in 2014, I had started this fitness-based mentoring program in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, called Benchmark Program, on the premise that weightlifting could be used as a tool to connect with at-risk youth. Kids who had been labeled as too old or too hard to work with, too into the streets, and in many cases, just too far gone. So to meet some of those students, I went into Lancaster City in one of the behavioral schools, one of the alternative education programs, and met Nate and a group of his classmates. I made this simple pitch to them. I said, I'm a personal trainer, and I'd be happy to work with you guys for free. I mean, work towards whatever fitness goals you have or train towards whatever sport you play. But in the process of working on those fitness goals, if we find out there's something else I can do to help you, some other academic or career-related goal, well, then I'd be happy to get into that with you as well. And much to my surprise, Nate took me up on that offer. We began to get together after school. We'd go to the gym and work out a little bit, but more often than not, we'd go to coffee shops and just talk about life, identify life's little problems and, and try and solve as many of those as we could. And we made a lot of progress, and Nate's life got better in a lot of different ways. And then we kind of lost touch. It wasn't until 3 a.m. that morning in the airport that I heard from Nate again with this simple Facebook message that said, bro, I got shot, and I really need to turn my life around. After a number of life-saving surgeries, I reached out to someone who I remember who was helpful in the past. Will came to my house, and from there, he helped me get my ID, birth certificate, social security card, and a number amount of jobs that I proceeded to quit after getting $400 for two weeks. $400 in two weeks compared to making $400 in an hour? I knew it was time for a change, but that was easier said than done. Now, it doesn't take a detective to determine that Nate and I come from drastically different backgrounds. That said, I couldn't let our differences lull me into the belief that I couldn't do something to positively impact Nate's life. I mean, I had been trained, after all, in how to solve problems. Grade school, the whole way up through college, that's what school teaches us, right? How to solve problems. And yes, as I was helping Nate out, I realized, all right, there are some systems-level problems impacting this guy's life. But I couldn't let those big, seemingly insurmountable problems distract me from going after some of the more day-to-day -day stuff, the more day-to-day -day challenges that I knew I could help Nate overcome. And when I realized, all right, this is having an impact, we're making progress, I went back to my friends and colleagues and I said, well, what if we as well-connected, well-educated, well-resourced individuals, what if we just trained more of our time and energy on solving problems in the lives of kids like Nate? How much of a change could we make? I never seen somebody work as hard as Will to help me solve these problems. Phone calls, emails, text messages, more phone calls, more emails, and more text messages. He created a voice for me in the school system and the justice system. In short, shit just got done. Now, the world is absolutely full of programs that are laden with rules and procedures. And sometimes they forget how simple it can be just to cut through the red tape and get a kid the help that they need. Now, I was only able to do that with Nate because I was a total beginner. I was doing what made sense to me, but I wasn't following anyone's rule book or playbook. I was assessing the situation, identifying the problems, and helping Nate to craft solutions. 
Now, if you're thinking about getting into this work, you can't disqualify yourself because you're a beginner and you don't have the background. Because over time, I've learned that that beginner's mindset, that fresh set of eyes looking at an old and stubborn set of problems, is sometimes the only way that we get the new and innovative solutions that we need. I've seen Will was struggling to figure out how to get me through these obstacles. And that did two things. One, it built our relationship up. And two, he gained a lot of respect for me because I've seen he wasn't quitting. Now, as I was helping Nate out, trying to get this organization off the ground, I was also cobbling together an income with my wife. And so the one thing I couldn't do for Nate was provide him with financial support. And for a long time, that really bothered me because I could see plenty of instances in which some financial support would have been very helpful to Nate. But it wasn't in the cards for me at the time. And looking back now, however, I realized that what I was able to give Nate was an asset of far greater value than anything in my bank account. That's an asset that each of us possess. I'd argue it's our most valuable asset. And yet it's one that we rarely think to share with the people that we're working with. Kids like me, we don't know what we don't know. How can we be it if we can't see it? We've all heard the saying before, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Let's get one thing understood. I had a network before I met Will. I found it to be a quite lucrative one too. Sure, it led to a near-death experience at 18, but one thing's for sure, I knew how to work the community I was raised in. The more I got to know Nate, the more it became clear to me that he and I had the same internal engine. We had the same drive to learn and succeed. Now, yes, we had applied that drive very differently in our lives, but then again, we were given separate socioeconomic ladders to climb in the first place. I was raised in a college-educated family. I had been to college, too. I had sat in the seminars and learned about the skills I was supposed to develop in order to be successful. Grit, perseverance, ability to rally people around a cause. And then I got to know Nate and came to see, here's this young man who's had none of the benefit, none of the advantage that I've had. And yet he's managed to develop these exact same skills. In fact, he's got some of them in spades. And I couldn't help but wonder, what if he had had access to the resources and the network that I had had growing up? And it didn't take me long to stop the wondering and resolve to start my own little experiment. One where I begin to connect Nate to the resources and the network in my life, the people who helped me out, to see what they in turn could do for him. Spoiler alert, it was rocket fuel for me. Will took me to local business meetings, meeting eye to eye with local business people. I know a lot of them in the back of their head were wondering, what is this big, tatted black man doing sitting in the corner of this meeting? But Will didn't mind. I still remember this after one meeting, he came up to me and said, what the heck was that? I looked at him and said, what are you talking about? I listened, I observed, I watched. He told me, what do you think I'm taking you to meetings for if I don't want to hear what you have to say? New concept for me. Over time, this strategy kind of crystallized for me. I had to begin by helping Nate to overcome the day-to-day -day obstacles, the stuff that was slowing him down, kind of keeping him stuck in place. But once we had moved beyond that, I really needed to connect Nate to people who had helped me out in my life, who had put me on the fast track, because I knew they could do the same thing for Nate. Now, without much of a plan, I, I simply began to invite Nate with me to meetings, to lunches, to dinners, to presentations where we present alongside one another. Eventually, Nate got really good at that, so he's presenting on my behalf and on behalf of the organization. I mean, heck, look at us today. I even invited him to do a TEDx talk with me. This all worked because I was hungry. Not just hungry for food, but hungry to learn. I always wanted to be the best. I was the best gang member and drug dealer in my area. Ultimately, I gave that up because I've seen how it ended. I mean, I've already been in jail and I already had a near-death experience. So I figured, what would I lose by exploring Will's network? Now, good mentoring work begins by first meeting your mentee's immediate needs. Uh, this is necessary. This is how you build a relationship and trust and rapport and show that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. But really excellent mentoring work, mentoring work that has a long-term compound ripple effect that's got a different component to it, this component of network development, of cultivation, network sharing. And it turns out there's some good research to support this premise. Julia Freeland is a researcher at the Clayton Christensen Institute at Harvard University. She tells us that our networks can be broken apart in two ways, strong ties and weak ties. The strong ties in our network are reserved for our family and our closest friends. These are connections that are hard to cultivate, and more often than not, we inherit them. And they also take a lot of our energy to maintain, so we just can't afford to have many strong ties. Weak ties, on the other hand, are much easier to cultivate. They take less of our energy to maintain, too. These are the acquaintances, the colleagues, the friends, the everyday people in our lives. And interestingly enough, it's these weak ties that do more for us in terms of our professional development. 
It's the weak ties that we leverage to get where we want to go. So in consideration of that research, I realized what I was doing for Nate was just helping him to develop his own new network of weak ties. Now, I was the anchor connection. I was the person that Nate could come back to, but also the person around which he could build this new web of weak ties. And that anchor and web analogy is also well supported in that research. It's a good thing that Will didn't give me money because I would have spent it right away. Ultimately, the best thing you could give a kid like me growing up is your network. Now, are we telling you to do what Will did, go into the bad school, find the bad kids, and take them to local business meetings? If you weren't following, no. We're talking about creating this buy-in, this consistency. A lot of times, if you ask me the first time, I would tell you I didn't want your help. The second time, guess again, I didn't want your help still. And the third time, I would definitely tell you no again. What we're talking about is the consistency, knowing that you're gonna be there, knowing that you're not gonna just give up on us, knowing that you're not gonna quit, but you're gonna put us in positions to be successful. So we have to begin by getting onto the front lines, into the trenches of our mentees' lives to help them get through those day-to-day -day struggles that have got them stuck and they're stressing them out. And once we've done that, we've created the space over time for some future-focused thinking where we can begin to help our mentees envision a life beyond their current circumstances. And once we've done that, then we begin the critical work of adding in bits and pieces of our network, bits and pieces that we can help our mentees cultivate into a network of their own a network that ultimately helps them achieve that vision of their future. Now, does this work out every time, just like I've described it? Of course not. You have to remember that many of the individuals we work with have significant levels of childhood trauma, trauma that's robbed them of the ability to feel good, to feel normal when things are going well. Instead of when things are going well, they, they feel nervous and anxious. They're waiting for the tide to turn, for something bad to happen. And if that doesn't happen, they could enter into some form of self-sabotage. And we've got to work with them through that process. This is long-term, day-in, day-out work. It's not as simple as just connecting two people and saying, hey, you're, you're a part of each other's network now. No, we have to stay in the relationships with our mentees, help them to feel comfortable, do the role model behaviors that our mentees need to see so that they learn how to move and how to behave in these new environments. Sometimes that means you decipher business jargon or you help to set a schedule or you help them understand performance feedback. Sometimes you set them up for a job interview and they don't show up. Or they show up and they get the job, but then they quit on day one, week one, or month one. Now, that's all par for the course. It's also important for us to remember that good, strong connections are not made strong by the fact that they never break or there's never any missed expectations. No, all of our networks, the strongest ones, have this pattern of success and then a setback and then a repair. That's very powerful for us to teach that lesson to our mentees through this work, that it's okay to fail as long as we have a repair. If you're a kid that grew up like me, you're about as far as from professional networking as you could imagine. You're probably at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, looking for food and shelter. But I'm telling you, take that chance, take that risk. There's people out there that wanna help you. Find those people that are willing to help you more than six weeks and six months. Find those people that are willing to introduce you to the network they have so you can get to where you need to go. My goal in doing this work was always to move the needle of progress as far as I could in the lives of the kids that I was working with to get the best return on my investment of time and energy. And young people who are in Nate's situation, they're the answer. Sure, there are other people out there who are a little bit better off from the start who could benefit from your network. But number one, they're not gonna move as far across that spectrum of risk to success as someone like Nate. And second of all, they're not as likely to go back into their community and spark the same kind of change that we've sparked in their lives. Now, how would Nate do something like that? Well, it turns out that networks, just like any other asset, are passed down from one generation to the next. Perhaps many of, in this room, many of us in this room here today are here in part because we benefited from a net network that we inherited, that we were able to leverage. So with that in mind, I understand that when I'm helping Nate, I'm never really just helping Nate. I'm actually helping the generations of family and friends beyond Nate who benefit from the network that he and I have created together. For the kids out there still running the streets, I got a message for you. Don't think it's weak to have people help you chase your dreams and get to where you need to go. That's strength. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of uncomfortable work. I challenge you to do the uncomfortable work and live a life that I live today. Safety and security, respect for my community, a better father to two of my kids, and still a mentor at Benchmark Program. At this point, the ball's in our court. 
If you've been successful in life, you understand that success is just a game. And if you've managed to play that game well, you understand there's one unspoken rule. And that is, none of us win alone. We win because we develop a great team, a great network along the way that helps us get to where we want to go. So it's time that we start, stop tossing around that platitude of it's not what you know, it's who you know. And it's time that we do something about that statement. We pull some kids off the bench, off the sidelines. We put them on our team. We help them work through their daily challenges and then we give them bits and pieces of our network and we help them to cultivate those pieces into a network of their own. That gives us the compound, the ripple effect that we're looking for. I'll leave you with the question that I asked myself in 2014 when I started this work. What if we, as well-connected, well-resourced, well-educated TED and TEDx watching individuals, what if we trained more of our time and energy on improving the lives of kids like Nate? How much of a change, how much of a generational change could we create? It's time to change the rules of the mentoring game. Kids like me, we need you, and not just you, but the people you know, to get us where we need to go. Thank you.